Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. I think this marks the beginning of something very important. Uh, photonics, and particularly integrated photonics, has a worldwide supply chain, and unless we can work together, uh, we're self-limiting. Uh, so I'd like to uh, discuss what we consider to be the grand challenges ahead and the timelines for meeting them, uh, in particular in the context of electronic photonic integration. Uh, we're talking about a transition of an industry, traditionally a customized photonics industry that served telecommunications and, and optics, if you'd like to add that in there, uh, to an industry which is now joining with electronics. And we have to figure out how that mating is going to happen, uh, what advantages photonics offers, and uh, how they're going to be implemented at a cost level, uh, which is not going to change the uh, value proposition of systems. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, the way JEPIX is looking at it and the way IPSR is looking at it right now, uh, particularly from the idea of applications and markets and costs. Uh, the IPSR is, is almost a 25-year uh, road mapping activity. Uh, this started well before the telecom uh, boom and bust and, uh, and ended up to where we are today. Looking at it right now, uh, uh, particularly from the idea of applications and markets and costs. Uh, the IPSR is, is almost a 25-year uh, road mapping activity. Uh, this started well before the telecom uh, boom and bust and, uh, and ended up to where we are today. Uh, we, we started out looking at uh, where the applications were uh, and we sort of developed a mantra that if we could develop uh, cross-market platforms, uh, we could standardize components and we could integrate uh, as a trend from uh, the mid-90s forward, uh, good things would happen for photonics. Uh, that happened to be a message that the photonics industry wasn't happy to hear because they were doing very well with very high margin customized products. Uh, and that was arguing for something that was quite different. But it's quite in line with what's happening today. And uh, in, in the JEPIX roadmap presentation, they look at each one of those with a separate chapter and describe where those things are moving and how to deal with it. Uh, in the IPSR, we've begun to target the supply chain and what do the suppliers need to know to be ready with their products uh, that they're going to add in all the way from wafers uh, to design uh, uh, automation uh, to tools uh, to the eventual users at the end. And the need to specify in detail what those are and what those timelines are is the key message I'd like to leave you with today and I'm hoping that we'll practice tomorrow in our technical working group breakouts. So who are the roadmap uh, stakeholders? In s simplest terms, it's the government, industry, and academia. The government is interested in uh, how do I make my investments uh, so that uh, I can create jobs and create a thriving uh, society. And uh, secondly, if regulation is needed, how do I make that regulation in a way that doesn't uh, uh, slow down the rate of innovation? Because innovation is the key uh, to that uh, economic benefit that's being created. Th think about industry, it's quite interesting. Uh, industry needs a supply chain coordination. Uh, one of the reasons why we feel it's very important uh, to interact with a worldwide roadmap is the supply chain is worldwide. There's no integral piece of it that can be captured in one country. So for each of us to think that uh, we can dominate everything with a vertically integrated organization is uh, a thing of the past. So supply chain coordination, what are the goals that I as a vendor have to meet and what are the timelines that I have to produce that such that there are no uh, uh, roadblocks in the supply chain as new products are rolled out. And secondly is learning. Uh, we think about a learning curve as something magic that the more we make of something, uh, the lower its cost becomes. But that learning curve is quite interesting. Uh, it isn't just a matter of making things. It's a conversation between suppliers and suppliers and competitors and competitors inform the suppliers and they inform back uh, to the people who are making uh, the actual products. So that 
uh, conversation uh, and integrating that all the way along the supply chain is the learning curve. It isn't just a series of S-curves uh, that are uh, creating innovation after innovation after innovation. Those S-curves are important and we need to support them, but uh, from an industry point of view, we really need to create that uh, conversation along the supply chain. And lastly, academia. Uh, what are the important problems that people should be working on? Uh, when I was working at Bell Labs, being in a problem-rich environment was the thing that we valued most, because we could always find something important to work on. And that's what a roadmap tells academia, and it also spurs innovation, because where we don't have a solution, uh, we're telling them and they can begin to work on that solution. So I will present uh, three levels of detail in uh, road mapping. One is what are technology goals and how we should define those. Secondly, what are the infrastructure targets that we have to meet and their timelines. And lastly, how much detail do we have to supply along the supply chain in order to be effective. Uh, these technology goals are important and they're application specific. So when I said cross-market platforms, we can really get in a bind if we have a thousand different platforms for a thousand different applications. So we need to limit the number of platforms uh, to the uh, fewest numbers of applications. So a technology goal example might be in steel for their roadmap. Uh, they have a different technology roadmap for uh, 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 high strength to weight steel for car bodies. Uh, versus high strength away steel for construction. And those are two separate roadmaps, two different alloys, and uh, one has to be formable and one uh, is, is more castable and machinable. Uh, if we think about the integrated circuit industry in its early years, uh, it was focused on memory as the primary application, and that drove all of the technology evolution. Then it was focused on microprocessors. And uh, now that shrink is over, uh, it really doesn't have much focus left over. And we're providing that, that next step for them. So let's talk about technology goals. Uh, we, we just saw the video, and this is just a, an illustration of that. Uh, everything goes to a data center. Uh, so the Internet of Things and how it's connected to the data center, we're part of that. Uh, at the end of the talk, I'll go back to a high level and give you some numbers on that. Uh, it's just quite impressive as to how that's expanding. But uh, if you just look at one application, high-performance computing, uh, the system performance in uh, floating point operations per second has increased at a steady rate of 1,000x every 10 years. And at more or less constant cost for the last 20 years. Now, if you think about that, that's, that's quite amazing because Moore's Law and what we're doing at the chip level is only 100x every 10 years. So something's happening at system level optimization uh, that is enabling this 1,000x every 10 years. And if we try to project forward uh, from, uh, from now to 10 years from now and 20 years from now, which we have to do because if we're going to build a roadmap and we're going to build it on platforms, we have to think scalability in every decision we make. We don't want to create a solution that only has a one generation lifetime. It has to be scaling forward. So something's happening at system level optimization in the past that is only going to be amplified in the future because photonics is enabling distributed systems. And we need to begin to think about designing not at the device level, not at the chip level, but at the system level. And that's going to cause a new economic calculation for how we value the cost of components. Because it's really the cost per function that the system is delivering, not the cost of a gigabit or the cost of a chip. So these are the constraints that jump out at you when you start thinking about how do I scale forward at 1,000x every 10 years and uh, keep the ball rolling. Uh, energy. Uh, the power density is an issue when you're trying to uh, 
uh, to do integration, but energy is an issue because every projection that you've seen uh, says we're going to use all of our electricity to power data centers or IP switches or, or whatever. The first one came out in Japan about uh, 15 years ago where they looked at just the IP switches in their system and projected uh, what the video uh, uh, content was going to be in their network. And they said if we just keep distributing this video content uh, through normal internet protocol, we're going to use all of the electricity generated in Japan by the year 2035 just for internet switches. Uh, so something has to happen uh, one way or the other. Uh, bandwidth density, we can't keep increasing the size of data centers, uh, so everything has to get smaller so that uh, more or less we can, uh, the football field size of a data center will be more or less uh, a standard and maybe even better. Uh, Port count, as things get more parallel, we have to put in more ports into the system and figure out how we can do that uh, with reasonable switching. Uh, functional latency, as we build more and more complicated systems, uh, the uh, latency is a key issue in energy efficiency. Because if we're spending energy to keep systems going, but we're not cranking out any results from that, uh, then we're wasting energy. So the more we reduce the latency, uh, the more effective and more energy efficient our systems are. Uh, utilization, we're putting out uh, capital investment into, into all of this uh, information hardware. Uh, and uh, if we're not using it, then uh, that's going to waste. And then lastly, uh, reconfiguration. Uh, the key to efficiency is not to make everything the same and have a CPU and memory and just uh, keep going back and forth. We've learned that lesson. Uh, the key is to build a system and configure it for a special purpose. And then when that we're using it for a different purpose, reconfigure it. And in doing a complex calculation or simulation, we often change the purpose in the midst of that. Uh, so the ability to do reconfiguration, uh, to apply uh, either a neural network or some sort of artificial intelligence to sense what the application is and configure the system for its highest efficiency is necessary to build in. And all of that is going to be enabled by photonic integration and photonic interconnection. And all of that is essential, but it's a new way of thinking about systems. But this is just taking a look at uh, where the commercial entry is. If we, again, if we look at uh, uh, the technology goals level. And you can, uh, I think we can get a couple of things out of this. Uh, this, the application would be here, the time frame would be here, the reach would be here, the, uh, the bandwidth that we need, the bandwidth density that we need, and the energy per bit. All of those things are scaling, and all of those are getting squeezed. And the ability uh, to look at where that is and continually relook at it, but uh, look at where it has to be in order to produce the system effects that we want is extremely important. We also need to look at the products and how that's moving forward. Uh, so this is just an example out of the roadmap for uh, silicon photonics. Uh, so uh, if you look back a year or so, uh, you can say that uh, we're mainly interested in interconnects and uh, a little bit uh, innovation in packaging. As we go forward, it's still interconnects and packaging. Uh, by 2020, beginning to think about uh, full integration uh, in silicon photonics chip and uh, applications in logic and memory uh, and in uh, system on chip and things of that kind uh, as we go beyond uh, 2025. So keeping your eye on these things gives you the ability to say, if I have to scale, what am I scaling toward? And if I create a solution today, is it going to fulfill the needs that I'm thinking about in the future? And each one of these, and I'll go into them uh, later on when we're looking at the, uh, uh, toward the details, each one of these has a unique solution uh, for photonics, which is somewhat different than it was for electronics. For instance, you need much more rigidity for photonics than we need for electronics. So how are we going to implement that at cost uh, and at high density? So let's look at the infrastructure targets uh, that need to be created to support this. If you look at manufacturing as a whole, uh, we came up with a list of uh, uh, key, uh, I would say, grand challenges for manufacturing. 
so the big thing is manufacturing system integration. Uh, we're designing for systems, so uh, do we need to make any changes in the way that we make things? The chip is not the goal anymore. It's the system. Uh, so the package has to conform to what the system footprint is going to be. And uh, uh, right now we're looking at onboard optical interconnection. And we have no idea exactly what that footprint is going to be. Is it going to be pluggable? Is it going to be uh, embedded in the board? Uh, is it going to be flyover fiber? Is it going to be embedded waveguides? All of these questions shouldn't be open anymore. We should know the solutions to them because the applications are there in 2018. And uh, it's, it's a scramble now, and uh, a lot of it is going to depend on how the throughput from manufacturing uh, can be achieved uh, at a reasonable cost. So standardization, materials, design, packaging, functionality, I'll go into solutions for these uh, in a little bit. Uh, performance is defined by cost and system requirements, and platform trade-offs. Uh, as I said, scaling forward involves cross-market platforms. So scaling cost. Simplicity is key to scaling cost. If you look at any learning curve analysis, uh, the exponent uh, in the learning curve is always related to the introduction of more and more simplicity as you move forward. Uh, integration, packaging, production volume. Uh, particularly important is known good die when you're scaling cost. And uh, that's something that's well uh, uh, characterized and uh, well known in uh, integrated circuit processing with electronics. And it's something we're just beginning to realize is important uh, with photonics when in the old days we used to think of a good wafer uh, and we'd throw, a throw away a bad wafer and we'd have a good wafer. And now we're thinking about line yield and dye yield and, and so forth. Uh, reliability is important. Uh, what are the failure modes? Uh, and these are failure modes in long-term test. And do we need to build in redundancy in order to have uh, long-term systems? And particularly in sensors, this is important. Because once we deploy a sensor network, we expect uh, long-term service. Uh, one interesting thing is if you survey the industry, the 2020 target for a silicon photonics transceiver is less than one cent per gigabit per second excluding the laser, because we don't know what the solution for the laser is. But that's, that's very small compared to uh, what we're typically getting today for telecom transceivers. And the idea is, how do you make that transition? And once you do, uh, how does that feed back into telecom? And should those companies be thinking more seriously about a different value proposition? Scaling power for function, as I mentioned, functional latency. Uh, Self-aware and self-regulating systems, we're already building that in with electronics. Electronics is still very short-range communication, but uh, if you have a multi-core chip, a core can decide whether the core next to it is being used or not just by measuring the heat uh, and the chip, and you can deploy resources based on that, and that's one of the more simple ways of uh, self-aware, and those are becoming uh, more and more active now. And then scaling up speed with parallelism. So uh, I mentioned the need for network reconfiguration to do that efficiently. And then lastly, scaling bandwidth density, uh, data rate, port count, and spectral bandwidth. And once you get into the idea of spectral bandwidth, you realize everything has to be single mode. And, uh, and that's quite different than uh, Vixel's pumping in uh, multi-mode fiber. So if we look at this from the application point of view, we can just take two applications, a data center uh, and Internet of Things sensors. Uh, the data center, we've got to pack more things together and, uh, and get up the data rates uh, faster. Uh, so uh, how do we do heterogeneous integration of memory, logic, power control, and photonics together? Uh, there are interposer solutions. There are, uh, uh, 2D packaging solutions, uh, but everything seems to be moving from the investment on the electronic side where the dollars are already there toward three-dimensional system and package designs. Uh, so we need to look at that and make sure that photonics is compatible or will be compatible with that. And then switch routers to enable uh, that reconfiguration. Uh, they have to be uh, looking at what kind of traffic uh, they're serving and uh, consider how to do a hybrid 
of packet switching and circuit switching in order to be most efficient and uh, lowest latency. With the Internet of Things, uh, I'll just mention this, this one in, in red. We're going to put out sensors everywhere. Uh, they're going to need to communicate with one another. Uh, they're going to have to operate for long term. But how are they going to be powered? Uh, so we have to consider ways of both tethered power, where they're connected to a power system, and energy scavenged power uh, from solar or from heat or from other things uh, as they're out there. So in general, the packaging evolution is to bring the electronics closer together because as the bandwidth goes up, electronics uh, can't support it except for shorter and shorter distances. And uh, the, the thing that we need to consider from photonics is uh, how does this activity in electronics feed into electronic photonic packaging synergy? So uh, let's just go through a couple of the infrastructure issues. Uh, electronic photonic design automation. Uh, seam we need seamless compatibility between uh, digital and analog CAD tools. That doesn't exist today. These are two separate uh, uh, organizations. Photonics is basically an analog uh, platform uh, doing digital work, and we need to consider how do we put those two things together and do it seriously. Uh, if we look down the performance scaling path, we need to be able to get to 128 terabits per second I.O. on a chip. Uh, but we need to do that by making trade-offs in design and to uh, essentially go through a path of good enough photonics. So telecom has been perfect photonics, devices everywhere. Once we start integrating, uh, we can uh, do more, more components uh, to get good enough photonics to get our system performance without having each uh, thing be perfect. Uh, so if we look in, in a timeline, we need validated PDK, mod PDK models for photonic circuits. Probably the most important thing, and I saw that mentioned in uh, one of the earlier slides, a foundry infrastructure for IP licensing and indemnification. That means a lookup database and licensing fees. Uh, all of those things need to be there if we're going to have a really serious industry. By 2025, uh, we need to have electronic photonic uh, design PDK models and uh, an IC package design platform for electronics and photonics. So uh, integrated circuits in the beginning, packaging was an afterthought. Uh, it isn't any longer, and uh, in photonics, we don't want to make that mistake. We want to design for package from the very beginning. Wafer assembly and uh, multi-project wafer runs, which is the key to development. Uh, laser integration is still open. Uh, is it going to be in the package? Is it going to be uh, hybrid or monolithic on the chip? Or is it going to be in the wall? And we'll just get wall plug light out just the way we get electricity out of the wall. This has to be solved, and there isn't any obvious solution to it yet. Athermalization is important, uh, particularly if we're doing tuning and filters. Uh, changes in temperature change the uh, index of refraction of materials by thermal optic effect, and uh, we need a scalable solution for that. And by 2025, uh, we need to understand where are we going to add gain and how are we going to have pervasive gain blocks in the circuits. Every time you do a split, you lose 50%. Uh, and you just can't keep doing that. So if we're going to be doing uh, complex functions with our photonics, we need to have integrated game blocks. Inline control and test, that's the key uh, to uh, manufacturing yield. Uh, uh, one of the key things is to limit the number of test protocols. So right now we have different protocols, and within that we have different protocols for hermetic and non-hermetic. And uh, we need to uh, cut that down so that it can be simple and fast. And I mentioned known good die before. By 2025, uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't have built-in self-test. If it's too hard uh, to add light uh, to a wafer to do a test, why not just do electronic test the way we always have and have your light sources and your uh, testers on the wafer already. The big issue is packaging, as I mentioned. Uh, so this just gives you a few targets for packaging. Cost of parts has to go from a hundredth of dollars to cents. Number of parts has to go from ten parts to less than five. Uh, the assembly time needs to go from minutes to seconds. Tolerance is down to 0.05 micron. Uh, assembly time from hours to minutes. Equipment cost, capital equipment cost, has to go uh, way down. 
Fiber attached has to go to seconds, and I'm saying we need to get rid of fiber attached. Uh, and test time needs to go from minutes per unit to seconds per unit. So that's, that's all. And uh, if, every, if, <laughs> if everything we're adding to the system is taking us in a different direction, then we're doing the wrong thing. So uh, we need a supply chain in order to uh, do packaging at low cost. Uh, we need to understand the failure modes. All of these are there for you to look at at some point, but I don't think everybody's interested in all of this. We need a comprehensive materials database uh, so that we can select the best materials and understand how they're going to behave under processing. Uh, we need to replace fiber pigtails. Is it going to be surface mount? Uh, is it going to be an optical pen equivalent? What is it going to be? It can't be uh, flyover fiber forever. And uh, pigtails are the equivalent of the old breadboarding of circuits uh, that we had before. So we know that's going to go, and we just have to figure out where it's going to go. And then lastly, scaling system packaging architecture. So uh, the CPU and ASIC, how do we put those together? Uh, and the interposer looks like an, uh, uh, the leading way to do that. And then uh, how do we put power into that, and how do we scale the I.O.? We need submicron to tolerances, and I mentioned before, rigid mechanical stability, and a low-cost, high-accuracy parts supply chain. So if we're going to do any assembly of parts, uh, it's very important in photonics to get the part dimensions to be precise. So we've always, it's just like the old days when we started to do assembly lines, we loosened up the tolerances as much as possible so everything would fit together. Well, now we're not doing that. Uh, everything needs to fit together with submicron uh, alignment tolerance, and uh, the ability to do that is something new and a new challenge. So let me say a few things about detail, and then I'll conclude at a high level. If you want to, uh, to make a roadmap, then you have to figure out what are the attributes that we're going to uh, look at over time. And so uh, when we just looked at the chip platform level, uh, we came up with this list of attributes. And uh, so I took this to the roadmap team and said, OK, we came up with attributes. What do we do now? And Bill Bonham said, well, you've got to prioritize them, and then you have to figure out what applications they go for, and uh, are you going to be doing memory, or are you going to be doing microprocessors, or whatever the application is, and try to figure out uh, whether you can get as generic a set of attributes for uh, a limited set of applications, and then you can chart them up. Right. So uh, it's not easy. I'll just have a few examples of these charts just so you can look at them. And these are the things that we distributed out to our technical working groups before they start. And you put the numbers in there the first time, the second time you refine them a little bit, and then the third time they get a little bit better. And you keep looking at them over and over and over again until uh, the industry aligns with this and this is informing the supply chain. So uh, this is just waveguides, transparency, what material they're going to be made out of, uh, what's the index contrast going to be, uh, what is its stability with respect to temperature, uh, how much power is it going to be able to carry, uh, what wafer uniformity do we need in order to uh, uh, be able to make devices out of that uh, uh, material, and uh, again, what is exactly the material system, which is going to change whether we're looking at a mid-IR mid platform or a uh, uh, telecom platform and so forth. Photo detectors, modulators, the same kind of things, same kind of attributes. Uh, and then the gain blocks, which I said, one of the big unknown, how we're going to make these gain blocks and, uh, and yield for those gain blocks is important. As someone who worked in laser reliability, I can tell you that uh, this is the most sensitive device that we'd be integrating into the, into the chip. So uh, creating these charts is, is uh, a difficult task in the beginning. Once you get them and populate them, uh, it's the way of moving forward. So now let's go back. Uh, to a high level, uh, so uh, anyone who uh, decided they weren't going to listen to all the numbers can come back to this. The, th uh, the key driver we started with was the Internet of Things and, and uh, the cloud. And so just numbers from the cloud, 2013, there were more connected devices than people on the Earth. And it would just go all the way down to what we're expecting in 2020, six devices for every person on Earth. And everybody doesn't have a device, so some of you have more than six. Right. So this is what's driving all the communications. And so in general, a system architecture is to con continue to migrate to distributed topologies for performance and energy reasons. 
uh, photonic interconnection is going to be the answer, and we need to be able to deal with that. What is electronics looking at? It? Electronics is saying, well, we've been following Moore's law, we're going to keep doing it, but uh, you can't scale transistors anymore. Uh, so let's scale the number of chips in the package, and maybe we can just add more chips to the package, and that will be a solution, but that's given us a power density issue. If we go to more than more, they're saying, well, everything is an option to continue scaling, and photonics is just one of those little things that we'll consider along with quantum this and that, and nano this and that. Uh, so uh, to be taken seriously, you've got to get out of this box and get back up into this box. And so communication-centric architectures, system-level design are the way to do that. Final slide, I think, is the one that uh, you might consider to be the most important. And this is probably a challenge mostly to the government and the academic uh, stakeholders in roadmaps. What is the biggest barrier to technology change? Is it the technology itself or is it us? And uh, uh, we think it's us. Uh, you're taking a risk, both at your corporation level and at your personal level, to implement a new technology. There's no guarantee that you're going to succeed, and you have to really be a risk taker to engage in that. There's a general acceptance of the incumbent solution. Copper works. Copper is easy to connect, uh, although we know it isn't going to scale into the future. But we're going to keep doing that because it's easier and we know that it works. And then lastly, cost and standardization. If we can't get the cost down uh, as we move from the board to the package with photonics, we're never going to be able to afford uh, to build those components. So it doesn't make any sense. Even if we can implement them, they're going to be too expensive uh, in our eventual system cost. So even though a learning curve is built of a thousand S-curve innovations, we need to seed those innovations in a way that people are interested in taking risk and they know where they want to go with the roadmap. Thank you.